Good morning, everybody. It's a fantastic honor to be here. And I'd like to start out by actually doing a little data collection with you all. Uh, by a show of hands, how many people looked at directions to get here at some point in their trip today? Oh, everyone knows where this place is, apparently. What is I'm sure you've looked at directions in your travels recently. Anybody? Yes, thank you. There we go. Let's let more hands. Now, I'd actually like you all to, to keep your hands up if, uh, when you looked at those directions, you used one of these, an old road map. All right, that's what I was looking for, right? Because this feels like ancient technology, right? There's a few stalwarts in the crowd, and we should talk later about VHS. Uh, <laughs> but this, to me, this goes back to a, a dark time in humanity, when planning a trip meant you had no idea what the best routes were, you didn't know what weather conditions were going to be like, and do not even get me started about folding these things back up. But thankfully, today we live in a world where with the click of a button, we can see the best route from A to B. We can see exactly how to get where we need to be with weather information, with traffic information, and you can make better decisions about how to travel. So what changed? Data. Google Maps here is taking in huge amounts of traffic data, weather data, historical data, and it's crunching it all down to give you the best route. And whether you're aware of this or not, our lives are increasingly being touched by these data-driven decisions. Data is driving our decisions about everything from what movies we decide we want to watch, to what products we want to buy, <laughs> to who we want to be friends with. Right? We're actually living really in this new age of exploration, this data revolution that's being born about because almost every interaction we take place in now occurs with something digital in between us or our world, a, a laptop, a cell phone. And all of those interactions then create data that can be collected and analyzed to help us better know our world, which is incredible if you think of the implications of all of that. And yet, all of the examples we just talked about, uh, looking at movies, buying products, where most of the efforts in data science are currently focused, are decidedly first world. These are you know, applications that make very comfortable lives ever so slightly more comfortable. It just feels like if we have all of this data available to us and the great potential that's there with it, we should be doing more than just making sure that when you guys leave here today, you know exactly where to go to get the cheapest pair of Ugg boots. <laughs> so imagine a world where instead of having Yelp show us where to go to find the best restaurant, we had applications that could help us find clean water or deforestation. I, I don't think I have to sell this crowd on the fact that that would be a pretty cool world to live in. Um, so the question I want to explore with you all is not what that world would look like, but how we get there, and, and in one of the big questions in that, I think, is who is going to help us get there? Who is going to shape this data-driven world? Well, let's start by talking to these guys, data scientists. Call them statisticians, data analysts, whatever you call them, they're the people who work with data to build tools so we can all make better decisions in our lives. And what's really cool about these guys is they work on data all the time, not just nine to five, they're working on their nights and weekends on it. Uh, increasingly, hackathons are becoming popular. And for the uninitiated, a hackathon is a 24-hour event where programmers, data scientists get together and just see what cool stuff they can come up with on their own. Now, I'm a data scientist, and I remember going to my first hackathon and being so excited, because here I am in this room with all these amazing computer scientists, people with the best machine learning skills and data analysis skills the world has ever seen, and we're just going to make change all by ourselves. I couldn't wait to see what we were going to come up with. It was going to be so revolutionary. It was going to have so much impact. It was going to be so world-changing. And what we came up with was so unfulfilling. <laughs> Right, here, here's an app that helps you park your car. Here's something that shows you local deals. And look, these are great apps, but they're more of the same. And the problem is if you give data scientists a chance to solve any problem, they're gonna solve their own problems. And a lot of us happen to be younger white males. And younger white males have problems finding places to park their cars, not finding places for low-income housing. So okay, maybe not the data scientists then, but uh, oh, if we wanna build a data-driven world, maybe we should look to the people who are already governing our world. Governments. These guys have huge amounts of data, data about everything we do, things that are going on in cities. And better yet, they're starting to make that data available. The Obama administration started a group called data.gov. It's a website where you can download vast amounts of government information from a huge number of agencies. And what that means is that everyone in this audience could go home right now and download huge amounts of information about uh, the earthquakes that happened in the past seven days. You could get the consumer price index over the past month. You could get the entire US census on your computer and just start digging in, start to find out what's in there. So there we go, there's our answer. Governments are gonna bring us the data we need. We're gonna make social and economic change ourselves. So let's get started. Let's hop over to data.gov and we'll just, uh, oh, oh, it's uh, data.gov lost its funding? That's, that's horrible. Now, don't worry, this article's a year old. Data.gov has its funding, but the reason it was on the chopping block is because no one was using it. 
The, the government didn't know how people might use the data. They didn't know who was going to use it. So they didn't release it in a way that they could. So all of that great data that could be used for change was a lot more like crude oil. You know, no one knew how to refine it. They didn't know what they were going to drive on it. So it was just worthless. OK, now hear what you're saying. Jake, if you want to create a better world, look to the people who are already trying to make a better world already, the social sector. These are your foundations, your nonprofits, and they strive every day to make the world a better place. And whether you know it or not, these guys are inundated with data. This is a group that brings clean water to people in Africa, and they have data about their surveys, they have data about well locations, they've got data about their finances. And even if they had no data on their own, there's all this government data we were talking about, or data made available from third parties like the World Bank. So they have all of this amazing data that they could use to better know their world, better know what they're doing. And so there's great potential there, but unfortunately, no one is looking at it. And understandably, these guys don't have the resources for a data scientist. They're not Google, they're not Amazon. So all that great potential just gets lost. So guys, I'm, I'm kind of bummed out, right? We have the data scientists who are gonna bring about this data-driven world. They've got all these skills, but they don't really have the right questions. And we've got governments with huge amounts of data, but they don't really know who to get it to. And, and social organizations doing such great things, but none of the resources to really look at it. Wait, wait, you guys are think you guys thinking what I'm thinking? What, what if we just got these guys together, right? What if it was the skills with the data with the cause? What would that look like? Well, that's what I was thinking when we started DataKind. It's a nonprofit that connects data scientists with government social organizations to work together to collect and analyze and visualize data in the service of humanity. And this actually came out of an angry blog post I wrote a year ago after that fateful hackathon. I said, ah, guys, why can't we do more? I want to use my skills with groups that are doing more than just getting people to click on ads. And it turned out I wasn't alone. Because by the end of that week, over 300 people had written to me saying, me too, how do I sign up? And in this past year, that's grown to 1,000 volunteers and over 100 people asking for help on their projects. And in that time, in that year, we've been working to connect data scientists with these groups so that they can better understand their situation, better know what's going on. And everything from weekend events, where they just get together for 24 hours, get a little bit of help, all the way to uh, six month to year-long projects. And the hope is that by bridging these communities, you give data scientists a chance to have social impact. You're going to give social organizations a chance to maximize their impact. And in the process, we all get to live in a better world. So let me show you some examples of what this looks like. The New York Civil Liberties Union came and said, hey, we want to know if the NYPD is using racial discrimination. Awesome question. And it turns out there's awesome data around this, too. You see, every time the NYPD stops and frisks someone, they record over 100 variables about it, where it happened, what it happened, whether an AK-47 was involved, huge amounts of info. So we're in a great position because we've got a great question and we've got great data, so let's answer it. So here's the data. So who can tell me if the NYPD is using racial discrimination? <laughs> right, yeah, no, me neither. And if you're a social organization, this is probably where you stop, if you even got this far. So they worked with our volunteers and they said, let's see if we can come up with something else. And they came up with this. It's a map of the 2010 stop and frisks by neighborhood. And what's immediately apparent is you can see things. You can see these hot spots up in Spanish Harlem, the, the hot spots in downtown Brooklyn. And what this provides now is a lens for NYCLU into that opaque block of data so they can start to explore. They can explore on their own. They can start to see what situations here they need to look into. And now they can start to answer that very thorny question. Another group right here in DC is DC Action for Children, and their job is to look out for the well-being of all children in DC. They have huge amounts of government data made available to them, but they don't know how to put it together to understand where the neediest children are and how to let other people interact with that information. They say, we've got all these spreadsheets about school performance, about uh, income, about education. How do we really dig into this to know something? So they worked with some volunteers uh, headed up by C.C. Way, a graphics editor at the Washington Post, and they came up with this. It's a screenshot of an interactive visualization where you can mouse over these regions. You can see demographics pop up and you can drill down to schools. And what this is doing is not only letting DC Action for Kids start to understand where the neediest neighborhoods are, this is serving as a template for all Kids Count programs across the U.S. That's pretty amazing. Lastly, the United Nations Global Pulse is an amazing program that is seeking to get a pulse of the world by collecting all of the world's data so they can understand whether recessions are going to happen because of what people are blogging about. It's a really fantastic program. And they recently did a very cool project called the Global Wellbeing Survey. They asked people to respond by cell phone. How happy are you in your country? It was a fantastic achievement for mobile technology to be able to pulse the world like that, but of course resulted in a bunch of data. 
And they didn't even have answers to the most basic questions like where did people respond? How many countries actually participated in this? So volunteers built this simple visualization that would allow them to see their reach, show how these responses spread from India across the globe. And this not only helped the UN understand where their reach was, this was so important to them, they brought it to the United Nations General Assembly to say this is how we have to start thinking about data. We can no longer do development without considering the data around our world. Now, if you're sitting in your seats and thinking, I could do that, maps, that's easy. Well, you're right, you probably could because all of these examples were done by volunteers in under 24 hours. And I think that goes to show that things that are very simple for a data scientist could be transformative for these organizations and groups that don't have those data skills. And what's cool to me is more than just the results that come out of these projects for the weekend, we're starting to see fundamental shifts in the way organizations collaborate because of these things. So we saw DC Action for Kids come to one of our events that we mentioned before, and they said, ah, oh, if only we had data about parent education, we could do so much more. Well, it turned out someone at their table was from the Census Bureau. They said, oh, government has that data. Do you need it? Here you go. So that collaboration allowed that government data to become usable. They started making that usable and giving to the people who needed it. Or we saw nonprofits sharing data with each other. GuideStar is a group that has all of nonprofits' financial data across the US. And they were trying to build a model to help predict which ones were going to do well and which ones weren't. They weren't having a lot of success, but they knew about another group called Great Nonprofits, which also had nonprofit data. They said, hey, would you mind if we use that? It could help us answer this question. Great nonprofit said, sure. Now, that's actually really fundamental. If that doesn't you know, ring to you guys, that's sort of the equivalent of Coke and Pepsi sharing information, right? They came together because there was a bigger cause. And lastly, the Grameen Foundation runs a fantastic program with knowledge workers in Uganda via cell phone, wanted to investigate the data around this. And they found that by working with us and looking at the data, it was so important to them that they set aside resources to hire a data scientist, a data scientist being hired into a nonprofit. I love that. And I'd love to know how many of you have data scientists on staff or somebody who would know that they could actually deal with data in this new era. So to me, these are the revolutionary changes that are going on, shifting the way people work in the collective to bring about this data-driven world. And the answer then, it's pretty obvious, it's not one of these groups, it's all of them working together, bringing together their resources for one cause to start to change the world. Now that's a happy ending. We could stop right there. It's pretty cool, did a lot of good projects, but there's something subtle here, a second story that's subtle, but I think very important. And it's that when I said we did these collaborations, I didn't say that the government commissioned Google and UNICEF to do this, no. I said that forward thinking nonprofits and social change groups used open government data and volunteer data scientists in their spare time with their own tools to build these things. And that to me hints at something bigger. That hints to me that we are changing the way we actually change our world. There's a fundamental shift in the way we do science. You see right now we live in a very top down world, right? Data is kept in institutions like governments, foundations, the skills are in Wall Street and Silicon Valley and oh, we leave the social good to those people with hearts. And, and traditionally, these groups have been very siloed. There's boundaries up between them. But increasingly, we're seeing these boundaries disappear. And people are starting to work between these groups, around these groups. And we're beginning to live in a bottom-up world. And I'm very inspired by a quote by Anne-Marie Slaughter when I think about this. And, and the quote that she said here was, as we've moved from a world of states to a world of governments and social actors, we've come to a networked world. And in that networked world, those entities we used to think of as billiard balls, and she's referring to those top-down entities, those billiard balls are just nodes in a much greater network that forms our society. And what she's talking about while she's talking about nation states, I think we're seeing all around the globe in science. We're seeing this rise of the collective, of people bringing their own unique skills together to solve common problems. And what that means is that we are actually all part of this data-driven world. Because whether you're somebody who works with numbers or somebody who climbs mountains, you have causes and you have skills that need to come together. If you're somebody who does have those tech skills, you can find somebody who needs things answered. Or if you're going out on an expedition or you're a social change organization, you can find designers, developers, all these people willing to help to work with you to solve these problems. And just imagine the questions we could answer together. I mean, imagine if we had the funding to scale this beyond just the, the 10 or so projects we did this year to include the hundreds more that we know are out there, the thousands that could be included with all of you. Because I think it's when we are all working together, all of us bringing our skills to this table, that we really start to make change, that we really start to take steps through this new data-driven era, know more about our world. And when we really start to just use data 
to actually stop just using data to, to figure out and make better decisions about what kind of movies we want to see and start using data to make better decisions about what kind of a world we want to see. Thank you.